Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. It's a very special part of our program. I have the distinct honor of introducing Secretary Baker, who has had a long and distinguished career in public service. He was the Under Secretary of State for Commerce, Under Secretary of State for Commerce, under President Ford. He was the Secretary of the Treasury uh, for Ronald Reagan. I made the mistake at lunch a few minutes ago of uh, offering an opinion on what I thought the Fed should do in response to yesterday. <laughs> and I was under-resourced, I promise you. Um, uh, he, um, along the way, he was Chief of Staff for uh, two presidents, President Reagan in 41. He was, he uh, led five consecutive presidential campaigns. He was our 61st United States Secretary of State from 1989 to 1992. During that time, he visited over 90 countries while confronting both the opportunities and challenges of the post-Cold War. During that time, he uh, uh, laid the uh, foundation for the reunification of Germany. He helped forge uh, with the president and assemble the coalition that uh, got uh, Iraq out of Kuwait. He led the Middle East, the Madrid Peace Conference, which is the first time that Israel and all of its Arab neighbors uh, got together. Um, he is also uh, not only a senior partner at our firm, Baker Butts, but his great-grandfather was one of the founders, and of course he is the honorary chair of this, the Baker Institute. So please welcome Secretary James A. Baker. Thank you very much, Andy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Baker Institute. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today, and we're glad everybody's here. I am uh, particularly proud that this summit is the product of cooperation between the Baker Institute's Center for Energy Studies and the law firm of Baker Botts. As you all know, both are very, very close to my heart. And their record of partnership over the years, I think, is an impressive testament to the power of collaboration. Now, this conference today will touch on all forms of energy, including natural gas, which reminds me of the time in 1982 when Queen Elizabeth invited President Reagan uh, to the UK for a state visit. Uh, I was chief of staff at the White House, and so we all started in the White House, we started saying to ourselves, what can we do to make this a really special visit? And Reagan used to have a plaque on, on his desk in the Oval Office that said, the best thing for the inside of a man is the backside of a horse. And so we thought, aha, Queen Elizabeth raises horse races. Reagan loves horses we'll have them ride horseback. So we get to Windsor Castle, 1982 it is. President gets on his horse, the queen gets on hers. She's in front and he's behind. We have them ride off on the grounds of Windsor Castle there before this great big assembled press pool, lots of cameras, lots of press. And as they approach the first hill uh, on the grounds of Windsor Castle, it's very hilly. The queen's horse starts going <laughs> like this, and she turns around. She says, oh, Mr. President, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Reagan never batted an eyelash. She said, it's quite all right, Your Majesty. I thought it was the horse. <laughs> he, he, he was pretty quick. <laughs> In fact, he was very quick. The subject of your summit today, Revolutions in Energy, 
I think possesses vast ramifications for the American and global economy for decades to come as science and technology and engineering are marching forward at the fastest paces they ever have in world history. The advances are apparent in virtually all parts of society, from energy to medicine to space exploration, and the innovation that accompanies them simply boggles the mind and tests the imagination. Smartphones instantly connect us today with one another around the world. Man will be heading to Mars by 2030, and long before then, most of us will have self-driving cars. Few areas demonstrate mankind's advancements, as well as those now occurring in the energy industry. It wasn't long ago that energy experts were warning us that decades of declining U.S. oil production would increasingly leave this country dependent on foreign oil. Those predictions pose severe ramifications, not only for our domestic economy, but in the ways in which we approach foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East. Until recently, the mantra most often voiced was a repetition of something President George W. Bush said during his 2006 State of the Union speech. He said, America is addicted to oil, which is often imported from unstable parts of the world. The best way to break this addiction, he said, is through technology. And so we did so, with some of our best minds addressing the problem. Spurred by the genius of George Mitchell from Houston, Texas, and other oil patch innovators, U.S. crude oil production last year broke 10 million barrels a day for the first time in 48 years. And that march forward continues. Recent news reports indicate an even bigger jump in U.S. oil production as this country is surpassing Saudi Arabia and Russia to become the world's largest oil producer. Who would have thunk it? The economic consequences of these transitions are dramatic, as we have seen across this city and across our state. But so, too, are the potential geopolitical consequences. The astonishing growth in American oil and gas production gives the United States greater strategic flexibility as we navigate the complex nexus of energy supply and global politics. Other energy revolutions, of course, are occurring that were unthinkable two decades ago. Texas, the nation's king of oil, now produces more wind power than any other state in the country. Still more innovation will be needed to address the global demand for energy that is expected to occur during the next two decades. Despite profound conservation efforts, that demand is expected to rise by about 30% by the year 2040. Future energy sources could include hydrogen cells, fusion, and ocean tides. We may even see a day when solar harvesters planted on the moon transmit energy back to Earth. Left unshackled, the competitive nature of our successful free market economic system will innovate and will produce solutions that will continue to boggle minds. As I mentioned a moment ago, we may be in a golden era. The world is going through a tectonic transformation, the likes of which we have never witnessed before. And it's one that brings tremendous opportunities. Yes, there are as well great risks in the world today. Global climate change, nuclear proliferation, and Islamic extremist terrorism are three, to name just a few. And violence and economic disparity remain difficult challenges around the world. <clears throat> On balance, however, more people may be living in relative peace, better health, and greater prosperity than during any other time in world history. And so, now in my 89th year, it saddens me greatly to see the daily drumbeat of dissonance in our country, even as the future does look brighter than ever before. When you read the newspapers or watch television news or engage in social media, 
you realize that something very insidious is happening in our country, something that one could even consider to be evil. It's sometimes hard not to cringe at the bankruptcy of our political debate. America's national ideal of e pluribus unum, that is, out of many, one, threatens to become a hollow slogan as jaded Americans constantly are confronted by tidal waves of animus from their televisions and their smartphones. We are increasingly divided along lines of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, and even sexual preference. Both political parties practice a game of identity politics that leaves too many of us squabbling with one another about our differences rather than talking together about the problems that we all face. Countless demagogues stand ready to exploit all these differences. Symbolic of our national anger, I think, is the partisan animosity today between Republicans and Democrats that has brought Washington to a complete standstill. We can't seem to get anything done legislatively for the people. Our government doesn't seem to work for us. We did pass a health care bill a few years ago on a straight party line vote and a tax bill last year on a straight party line vote. But bills passed on straight party line votes never survive the next change of administrations in Washington. These divisions are real. In our national politics, maintaining lines of civil and constructive communication seem increasingly more difficult. In this burgeoning new age of red meat national politics, everybody uses the misbehavior of others to justify their own misbehavior. The result is that the responsible center of American politics appears to be experiencing a death knell. There are many factors responsible for this partisan divide that really does threaten to undermine our democracy. Our constitutionally mandated redistricting process pushes congressional districts to safe seats that squeeze the center out of our politics, and with it, the practice of compromise. Social media lowers our national debate into an angry brawl that transforms Americans into howling rabbles that have replaced their pitchforks with smartphones. Further, traditional journalism is increasingly hard to come by as the line between commentator and reporter is too often blurred. The press have become players in our national political debate. They are no longer dispassionate, objective observers and reporters of the facts. That is not good for this country. As a result, we've become an evenly divided, red state, blue state nation, more intent on waging political battles than finding ways to advance the common good. At this point, let me note that the bickering and the belly aching has many wondering if America's best days are in the rearview mirror. And I want to tell you something. I personally don't think they are. Yes, other countries are catching up with us, economically and technologically, China in particular. But that's more of a function of their adopting the same free market approaches that have benefited the West since the end of World War II than it is of our own national backsliding. Of course, no one can tell you what will happen in the long run, but the United States should remain the world's strongest power for decades to come as our economic, military, and diplomatic advantages continue to far exceed those of our competitors. Still, there's a great deal of national anxiety in this country that too often digresses into hysteria. <clears throat> the resulting cacophony has largely silenced sane and rational political debate at a time when we face some tough domestic and international challenges. Unwavering party line votes have become commonplace as our elected officials mirror the attitudes of constituents whose opinions 
are rapidly diverging. Last year, a Pew Research Center poll indicated that Republicans are moving further to the right and Democrats are moving further to the left. The further apart we split, the more tribal we become. Gallup polling indicates that today, twice as many Americans oppose marriage outside of their political party as did in the 1950s. Today, almost two-thirds of Americans would not want their son or daughter to marry someone from the other party. Astounding. So you ask, what can we do to revive the type of bipartisanship that is necessary for our government to get things done? <coughs> in Washington, that's going to take leadership in both parties. Once again, we're going to have to find a way that Republicans and Democrats can and will work together and compromise in order to get things done and handle the people's business. Our country has survived and thrived for so long, in large part because we have worked together on important issues. Compromise in a democracy is essential. Our founding fathers differed on many, many issues, but they worked out compromises to define our core principles that still hold true today. And so too should our current leaders. With that in mind, I want to talk to you a little bit today about a proposal that I believe can attract the type of bipartisan support for which, frankly, I think many Americans long. I'm talking about a plan that I and my former fellow Secretary of State and Treasury George Shultz and several other conservatives have proposed for a carbon dividend plan, not a carbon tax plan, a carbon dividend plan. At this summit last year, I went into some detail about such a plan, so I'd briefly like to review it again today, but then go into greater detail about why I think it is such a good bipartisan approach. The proposal can be broken down into four pillars. First, a gradually increasing carbon fee is imposed on the production of carbon. Most economists argue that such a fee is the most cost-effective way to reduce emissions. Unlike the current cumbersome regulatory approach, a levy on emissions would free companies to find the most efficient way to reduce their carbon footprint. Second, all proceeds, all, every penny, all of the proceeds from the fee would be returned to the American people in the form of a carbon dividend. This way, the revenue neutral fee would benefit working families rather than growing the government and boosting government spending. A $40 per ton carbon fee would provide a family of four with roughly $2,000 in carbon dividends in the first year, an amount that could grow over time as the carbon fee increased. Estimates indicate that 70% of Americans would get more money from such a dividend than they spend in increased energy costs. Third, border carbon adjustments would be established that protect American competitiveness and encourage other countries to follow suit. Pioneering such a system would put America in the driver's seat of global climate policy. It would also promote American competitiveness by penalizing countries whose lack of carbon reduction policies would otherwise give them an unfair trade advantage. And fourth, and most importantly, government energy regulations would be rolled back once such a system was in place. Much of the Environmental Protection Agency's regulatory authority over carbon emissions could be eliminated, including an outright repeal of President Obama's Clean Power Plan, which the current administration is working to do anyway. I am very supportive of this proposal for many reasons. As I said last year, the carbon fee we propose would help steer the United States toward a path of more durable economic growth by encouraging technological innovation 
and large-scale substitution of existing energy sources. It would also provide much needed regulatory relief to United States industries. Companies, especially those in the energy sector, would have the predictability that they now lack, removing one of the most serious impediments to capital investment. But there's another reason why I think this is a good idea. It's the type of policy solution, solution that can and should attract support from both Democrats and Republicans alike. Remember, folks, where a politician stands on an issue usually depends on where that politician sits. And the plan for a carbon dividend has something for those sitting on both sides of this debate. And you don't even have to acknowledge that the climate is changing, or certainly that man is responsible for it, to support this plan. Under our plan, Democrats get the carbon fee they have wanted for a very long time, as well as a solid approach to climate change. Republicans, on the other hand, get rid of growth-limiting regulations that stifle our economy. Those same Republicans can also very legitimately argue that this fee is not a tax because the money doesn't go to the government but is returned, fully returned, to all of our citizens pro rata. All Americans would get good things out of this proposal. They would get cleaner air, and they would also get a quarterly cash dividend. Such a pragmatic approach would be the basis for a long-lasting agreement that could withstand the test of time. That's one of the reasons it has the support of env environmental groups, such as, the conservation, such as Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy, as well as energy providers like ExxonMobil, Chevron, BP and others. These divergent groups want a consistent, long-range approach to climate change rather than seeing the issue ping-pong back and forth when the occupants of the White House change, as they inevitably will. Earlier this week, the proposal got a big lift from Exxon, which pledged $1 million over the next two years to help fund a lobbying effort that is being spearheaded by former Republican Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott and former Democratic Senator John Bro of Louisiana. I expect that other major oil companies will soon follow suit. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if this proposal for a carbon dividend will get traction in Washington anytime soon. Looks to me like the chances are increasingly better they're certainly better than they were last year when I first mentioned this. It has some support, but obviously there's still a long way to go. But I think it is so rational and so logical and has good things for both sides and for the American people that I'm somewhat optimistic. Sadly, there is so much rancor up there that it's hard to see either side finding the time civility and common sense to stop fighting and start doing the people's work. But as I said, I'm still nevertheless very hopeful that something can be done. Such a plan can not only serve as an insurance policy should predictions of man-made climate change catastrophe prove to be true, but it can also bring Republicans and Democrats together for a common purpose, and that is a rare occurrence in the zero-sum political environment that consumes Washington and, in my view, threatens our nation. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, as usual, fantastic and captivating um, and logical. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully there are, are, are 
ears perked up uh, beyond just in this room that are really giving serious consideration to these types of approaches to a, re a very real issue. Um, with that, I want to call up our next panel, um, uh, which will be focused on the, on the Permian Basin. Uh, so, Ellis. Good afternoon. Can we get the slides pulled up? There we go, perfect. Hi, I'm Jim Barkley. I'm a partner in the energy practice at Baker Botts, and I will be moderating this panel. Um, we have a great group of panelists. That's weird. I have no idea how that got there. Imagine that. Um, we have Gabe Collins, who is uh, one of your own here at the Center for Energy Studies at the Baker Institute. John England, who is with Deloitte and their uh, partner in their oil and gas practice. Uh, Joe Gatto, who is the president, CEO, and director of Callan Petroleum, uh, which has extensive operations out in the Permian. And Amir Gerges, who is the general manager for the Permian at Shell. Uh, we're going to try to do about four things. We're going to try to give you an overview of exactly what's going on in the Permian. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about what's, what some of the challenges are that are being faced out there. Third, we'll talk about how we might meet some of those challenges, what the opportunities uh, are that are created by those challenges. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the impacts beyond the Permian of what's going on out in West Texas, both domestically in the U.S. and around the world. And then we'll try to save some time at the end for some questions and answers. Uh, to kick us off, I'm going to ask John England to start uh, an overview, and then we'll ask others to chime in as, as they like. And by the way, uh, we are perfectly happy to be interrupted by questions uh, during the panel discussion. There's no need to wait to the end. Okay. Um, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, and uh, just want to first of all say thank you uh, to Jim. Thanks to Ken and to the Baker Institute for uh, asking me to speak today. I, um, honored to be here. I have to say when, when Ken reached out, I was... Uh, I was very excited about that opportunity. He did not mention that I had to follow James Baker. Um, so <laughs> you, you didn't. I did. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, that is a tough act to follow. But uh, nonetheless, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. So um, I, I thought I'd just start with a little overall context on the Permian, um, a little bit kind of around state of play. And certainly my other panelists can feel free to, to jump in. You know, I think may, maybe the starting point is to think a little bit about, about context and history here. Um, the Permian, you know, is a, is a is and has been a prolific uh, oil and gas producing field for a long time, um, you know, dating back to the 20s. Um, and, you know, I think what, what you had, though, like you had so much of U.S. production, was that up until around 10 years ago, you know, really what it was was a, a, a large conventional field um, that was probably starting, you know, in decline, um, although it was still producing, you know, reasonable number of barrels. Um, it wasn't the hot play anymore, and, and certainly the, the world was looking at, you know, deep water and, and, and a lot of other um, interesting plays all over the world. And 10 years ago, all our discussions mainly were on how were we going to get access to, to oil in um, other parts of the world? Um, the NOCs were taking over the world. There wasn't any room for U.S. Uh, companies or, or, or independents to play. So it was a very different you know, state of play. And you, you think about how quickly all that changed. And I think that's what's fascinating to think about, that here we are you know, somewhat like 10 years later, and you know, we've got tremendous growth that's happened already. And um, I think some of this is, is on the charts. But even if you just go back 10 years, I mean, uh, the Permian was producing less than 900,000 barrels a day. Um, and 10 years later, it's at 3.5 million barrels a day. Um, gas went from about 4.5 uh, BCF a day to about 12 BCF a day. So, so just in a 10-year period of time, uh, we've had this just massive increase in terms of what's happening. 
in the Permian, and even more recently, as, as the, the slide kind of indicates, just in the last four years, you've seen a 110% increase in production, in oil production out of the Permian. Um, and, and the gas, um, I'm sorry, and, and you know that represents a third of U.S. production now. So, I mean, just one very huge prolific field is now representing one third of U.S. production. And as, as uh, uh, Secretary Baker pointed out, you know, the U.S. is now you know the leading oil producer in the world, uh, over 10 million barrels a day. So it's uh, it's a it's an amazing time. And the Permian, to some degree, has been has kind of led us there in in, in terms of where where we're at. Um, at the same time, the, the somewhat less told story is the natural gas story coming out of the Permian, because um, largely what we're seeing is is you know the Permian for the most part is being drilled for the, for the oil and liquids, but we have this tremendous amount of associated gas that's really flowing from the Permian at this point, um, and you know I think you know moving just in this short period of time to up to 12 BCF a day, um, still far behind you know the Marcellus, we are our biggest kind of oil or excuse me gas producing field in the country, but nonetheless per, the Permian's a, a big part of it. And when you think about the, the associated gases, you know effectively a byproduct, um, it's interesting to think about how that impacts markets and and how that kind of to some degree caps prices on on natural gas in our country. So it's a it's a it's a big element in terms of um, U.S. gas pricing. Um, if we maybe go to the next slide, um, I'm just going to talk about kind of maybe the, the projected growth pattern. Um, and you know, I think what, what's interesting is we, we still aren't to the end of this growth story around the Permian, despite the tremendous growth that I just pointed out over the last four years. Um, you know, we see that continuing to grow. In, in 2019, we expect um, growth up to 3.9 million barrels per day. So you know, think about it, that's adding on an average about 600,000 barrels a day just year over year, just phenomenal growth. Um, you know, that's growth that's bigger than many oil producing nations, in fact, if you think of it that way. So uh, you know, tremendous from that perspective. You know, we've also seen, uh, an, it, we expect that to continue to grow. I mean, the, the evidence of that to some degree is the amount of um, drilled but uncompleted wells out there as well. So, you know, we, we've got all these ducks, as we refer to them, that, that effectively are very easily brought online at this point and can bring a lot more supply to the market relatively quickly. Um, you know, overall, you know, EIA, I think, estimates the number could go as high as five and a half million barrels a day out of the Permian by 2025. So, you know, this is clearly growing to be one of, if not one of the most prolific fields in, in the world. And, and that's really how we need to think about it is this isn't just big for Texas, um, which we're very proud about. This is big for the world and, and it's making a significant impact um, on that. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about why this has happened, you know, and why we've had this tremendous growth, I mean, a, a couple things. I mean, you, you probably all know the shale kind of revolution story. And, you know, to me, it's a story of, um, like so many things, it's where market dynamics meet um, technology and, and, and innovation. So, you know, when we had $14 gas in 2007, people said maybe we should try that shale thing a little harder. And, uh, you know, we put together hyd hydraulic fracturing horizontal drilling and that all came together to really start this shale revolution. But but what we got to the Permian, what we see is, you know, it's all about, because the mindset that's changed is it's all about resource now. It's about the rock. And um, in the Permian, you have this, and there's people with much better geology knowledge than myself on, on the panel, but um, we have a, just a tremendous resource and one that's got so much more upside to it and, and just lends itself to, it's almost like a, an, an experiment um, you can play with in terms of the, the different ways to continue to make laterals longer, to use pad drilling, all the different things that can continue to grow the production. So it, it's phenomenal. The, the economics are, are world class and the technological advancements that are, that are happening really every day are tremendous. And I know some of my panelists will talk about that. Um, the, the last thing I just want to mention is kind of how the players have changed a little bit. So um, if we kind of look to that, I mean, for, for many, for a long time, I think people thought of the shale play as uh, an, in, an independent play, right? We heard a lot of stories about how, um, you know, at the beginning of this shale play, it was, it was the independents, um, like Mitchell Energy, but like many others, who, who really kind of, you know, unlocked the potential of shale. And that's very much true. But I think what we're finding, and particularly in the Permian, is it's becoming a big company game. Um, and we're seeing that in the fact that so many of the super majors are starting to have or develop very, very large positions 
there. Now, I think there's a couple things behind that. One is just capital allocation, um, particularly coming out of the downturn that we just went through. And I would point out the worst, you know, the longest downturn we've ever had um, when we look at look at that. And, and I, I point that out a lot just because people like to say, you know, we've been there before, we've seen this. We really have never seen a downturn like we've just kind of gone through. So it's important to understand the legacy that leaves behind. But part of that legacy, in my opinion, is not only did it take, uh, at least in the short term, it took a lot of capital out of the industry, but it also refocused capital and a lot more focus on short cycle projects. And that's what makes the unconventional plays, and particularly the Permian, so attractive is these are short cycle projects. I can get in, I can deploy capital, and I can start cash flowing relatively quickly. And I have kind of capital flexibility because I can scale that back much easier than you know my deep water projects, uh, my heavy oil projects, some of the things I've done in the past. So I think the capital flexibility makes unconventionals very attractive, and it makes the Permian pretty much the most attractive of those unconventionals. Um, and so that's brought a lot of capital in, particularly super major capital. The, the last thing I would say that I think has really drawn, you know, the majors into this space is, you know, this is very much looks like a manufacturing type um, uh, activity once you get into it in, in, a, in a big way. And so the scale that the majors can bring, I think, has, has started to, to come to bear on, on the play. And um, so, you know, I think it's, it's a fascinating time and, and there's a lot more to say, but uh, I'll stop there for now and let some of my other panelists kick in. Joe and Amir, y'all are out there doing stuff. Tell us what's going on. Sure. Well, first, let me uh, let me say it's it's a great honor to be uh, to be here, and thanks to the um, um, Baker Institute and the uh, Baker Bots uh, for for having us, and, and it's great to be part of this distinguished uh, panel. Uh, before I just put some comments, I'll do a, a quick survey, if I may. Just put your hand up if you've been to the Permian. Just I want to show up. Okay, so so that's probably a. 35% of the, of the people. I would say if you haven't been to the Permian, try and go and see the Permian, because seeing it is quite different than just uh, hearing about it. Um, a couple of things that John has, uh, has shared um, uh, are quite interesting. Um, obviously, the, the boom in the Permian and the hype that we see and the growth, um, this is immense. It's a huge opportunity. The ramp that we see in the Permian is unprecedented. I don't think we have seen any basin um, any OPEC country that has um, increased and ramped up production at that pace. We're going at roughly 1,000 barrels a day, which is, to put it in perspective, that's, uh, that's like creating a, a oil major every three years in the permit. Uh, roughly speaking, that's a, a million to a million and a half of, uh, of crude production. That's, that's the equivalent of a major in the permit. That growth is... Um, is going to have its impact. It's absolutely like um, Secretary Baker said in terms of securing um, the U.S. energy demands, and now we're getting into a, um, the, the export uh, phase. Um, but it's also a challenge because the, the Permian um, has very, very limited barriers to entry. We have about 50 operators in the Permian and 50 non-operators. So these are companies or institutions that own shares in the Permian that you know, don't, don't operate. It's different than any other type of upstream business that any of the majors have been and certainly any of the, the independents. It creates that um, opportunity space, but, but the challenge uh, space as well. Um, and and we, will, we will see, as, as John said, a significant amount of consolidation. Uh, the majors were seen to be late to the game, but now, as you've seen from the chart that uh, John has put in, the consolidation is happening. Um, it doesn't take much for two of the pure players, the EMP companies, to combine and create another major player in the Permian, and we'll see a lot of these uh, happening um, in, in the past um, a few, few months. Uh, but certainly we have, we have issues with that growth. The infrastructure build that um, has um, uh, slowed down when we had the old downturn in 2016 have caused us to see some bottlenecks in the evacuation from the basin at this point in time. Um, and we're seeing that to be transient, but that's, at the moment, one of our biggest short-term um, issues in, in, in the basin. Um, the other thing we see as a challenge is that uh, disparity between um, the, the diversity of companies that work in the Permian um, and the difference in their environmental agenda, social responsibility agenda, operating principle, and operating uh, excellence as well. Um, and this is where an area like the Permian 
could only survive, it can only get to its growth aspiration if we see a lot more collaboration across the industry, um, if we want to get to that five, million, six, uh, five to six million barrels of oil a day. Joe? So uh, again, thank, thank you. I'll echo Amir's uh, thoughts up front. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. It's the first time I've been at this conference. Uh, it's great to see all this interest in the energy business, especially in the Permian. Um, I'm, I'm going to provide a little bit of a, a different angle what Amir talked about. And my company is Callan Petroleum. Uh, we were founded in 1950 in Natchez, Mississippi. We've seen a lot of cycles. I think it's pretty unique for a company of our size. We're about a $4 billion company today, publicly traded. But we've been through a lot of different basins. We've participated in geothermal. We've been nimble uh, as an energy company. But the Permian has been quite remarkable. So to give you some context, we are nondescript EMP number 10 up here uh, over, over to the right. Um, and we've been uh, operating in the basin since 2009. Over that period of time, we've grown uh, our production about 40-fold. So we're you know, a microcosm of what's going on out there. But uh, a, just a, an amazing resource base that's been in place, right? We, we've, as an industry, been in resource capture in the Permian Basin. There's an enormous amount of oil in place. And the last several years has been this resource grab that has gone on, right? This land grab that we've all heard about. A lot of deals have been going on. We took part in a lot of uh, on our, uh, our ourselves, used the public capital markets to, to do that because everyone saw the potential here of what this resource base could be uh, moving forward. And it's really differentiated why it's a single basin. And we've seen single basins come and go in the United States over time. The aerial extent of this resource base coupled with several layers of horizontal development, you know, could be up to eight or nine that, that we know about right now that are being actively developed. We produce from seven as we sit here today. But, you know, it's one thing to have the resource base, but it's applying technology in the right way, right? I mean, that, that's how we got to this point. We talked about it up front. We applied technology, high, uh, horizontal completion techniques, hydraulic fracturing. You know, for us, to give you, again, another data point, our first well, horizontal well we drilled out here, we, previously we did vertical, uh, was drilled in 2012. And the estimates for ultimate recovery from that well were about 400,000 BOE. So this was six years ago. As we sit here today, the ultimate recoveries on average, about 900,000 to a million. Just to, just to think about that for, for a second, it just it gives you a sense of the enormity not only the resource base, but our efficiency of capturing it. We're, we're capturing more from these shales than we ever thought we would <clears throat> in terms of what's ultimately recoverable. So that's obviously been a step change for the resource base. But the real challenge now is how do we turn that into cash flow, right? How do we do this efficiently from an economic standpoint? But more importantly, how are we going to do it from a responsible, in a responsible way, right? Whether it be landowners, stakeholders, the environment, uh, you know, working with the regulatory commissions in the right way. This is the challenge for all of us. It doesn't matter if you're Shell or you're Cal and Petroleum, right? And that's, I, I know there's a lot of focus on scale, and I think it's easy to make parallels of, well, bigger is better. This is a manufacturing operation. I'd argue it's, it's not quite that easy. This is not a manufacturing operation. The complexity of these reservoirs is, is enormous. Uh, the challenge that we face right now, frankly, is, is an industry is how are we going to develop all these layers of the cake, right, if you think about it? Because um, they intercommunicate in, in certain areas, right? And, and it varies area to area, not to get too far afield here. But if you develop this zone, you might, it might have an impact down the road on the zone below it or the one above it over time. And you might be leaving resource into the ground. So we as an industry have to figure out how are we going to characterize that reservoir? How are we going to modify our completion techniques to effectively drain that resource? Because you're going to get one shot at it. I mean, you could go back and potentially recomplete down the road, but that's not economically efficient. So there's, while we've come a long way in terms of defining the resource, we're going to have to continue to apply technology to capture that resource, which will ultimately, you know, these projections will hopefully come true, but we got to get this right because we might leave a lot of resource in the ground if we're not being thoughtful, continuing to apply technology. I'm confident we're going to do that, but it's going to be a lot more complicated than a simple manufacturing business. And 
I guess the other thing to point out is on the egress out of the, the basin. You know, there's a lot of oil, a lot of gas, and a lot of NGLs coming out of there. Pipelines are certainly a constraint. Uh, I think you've probably heard a, a lot of this, this talk uh, over the last several months, mostly on the oil side. We're going to face the same challenges on gas and NGLs. Uh, good thing is that capital is rational. Uh, we've seen a lot of projects put on the board, certainly on the crude side, gas is coming, NGL is a little bit far behind, but it's getting there. Uh, as well as we're, we're rational as well as economic uh, companies. You know, we're not going to maybe go as fast as we could, right? We're not going to just uh, dam the torpedoes and continue to drill ahead if the, if, the, if the egress isn't there. That's certainly a challenge. And, you know, beyond that, I'd say the, the biggest challenge that we'll probably face is labor and attracting quality folks. Part of that is <clears throat> we need more infrastructure in Midland in the Odessa communities, right? We need to be investing in schools. We need to be investing in the hospitals. And there's you know, a lot of attention on that. Uh, and there's a lot of public-private partnership opportunities I think you're going to see in, in the future uh, that help address this. But labor is going to be a constraint. It's great to see uh, you know, close to 0% unemployment. But it also explains when you walk into a restaurant, you say, well, this, this town is booming. Why is half of it uh, roped off? It's because you can't get any wait staff. It's, so there's some interesting things going on. But that's going to be a, a, a limiter, I believe, to you know, where we can take this resource base going forward, being able to attract the right people. But it's going to take investment in, in, in the community to, to attract those people. John, let me back up for just a minute. You mentioned, I was, I'm interested, you mentioned the need to better define the plays and to avoid um, developing in a way that's less efficient than it should be. Where does that conversation take place? Is it at the regulatory agencies like the Railroad Commission? Is it in the industry groups? Is it just among the, the companies who are out in the fields or is it a combination of all of those? It's, it's largely gonna be industry groups. And, you know, for us that are public companies, we have to answer to our investors, right? You, you've advertised that you've got this great land position and all these opportunities. Well, you know, if, if you're not doing the right thing in five years from now, you've created more reinvestment risk for your investors if you haven't captured the resource base in the right way. So it's largely an economic versus a, a regulatory uh, standpoint, but hopefully, um, you know, re regulatory agencies recognize this is a resource that's going to bring revenue to our, uh, you know, communities and, and, and states that they, they uh, try to advance consortiums and try to have data sharing because it's, it's everyone's resource and they want to capture it in the right way. Uh, Amir, if you want to. Yeah, and I, I fully agree, Joe. I think there is also a number of um, um, partnerships and tests. We, we have just signed up a, um, a trial in partnership with the Department of Energy to test the uh, frac efficiency and intensity in, um, in part of our Permian Basin. Um, it's a test site. It's, a, it's more like a research project. We provide the opportunity, we provide the rig, and we drill the wells. But a lot of the uh, monitoring that we're doing is, uh, is, is really research. And uh, um, we're glad, we're happy with that, with that partnership because it's a national resource. I think the, um, the interesting, interesting piece is, is that's really the, the mojo. That's not really the equation that everybody's trying to solve. What is your you know, efficient, most efficient spacing and how many layers you want to develop at the same time. So as Joe said, you don't uh, leave any, um, um, any resource behind. Um, the, other, the other note I would make is, is the piece that Joe referenced, which is, uh, which is technology. I think we didn't even scratch the surface in applying technology in onshore compared to uh, what, we've, uh, what we've done in uh, deep water, even shallow water, integrated gas. Um, artificial intelligence and um, Internet of Things and predictive um, analytics are, are taking over. Um, in, in Shell, we drill all our wells actually from Houston. We have six rigs operating in the Permian. The six rigs are uh, drilling the wells from our 11th floor in, in, um, in our Wood Creek uh, campus. And actually tomorrow we are starting to spud the first artificial intelligence geosteered well from Houston. It's a machine that's actually threading the needle. If you just imagine this is, we're trying to put a well that's 20,000 foot measure depth in an area that is 200 feet of thickness. So it's like threading a needle. And in the past we used to do this with analyzing a lot of the data we collect from the wells. Now it's actually going to be all via a machine. And I think that's now 
the next step in where our business is, is going. We've already started to slide into the discussion of challenges, but I'm going to turn it over to you, Gabe, for a minute. Talk to us about the, the water issues that we're facing in the Permian. So I'll open with just a word of regret as I don't, I'm, I don't have any AI drilling rigs and we don't have any fun horse flatulence stories, but we get to talk about water in a desert, so I, I, I think we can still <laughs> keep it reasonably interesting. So I guess, you know, I always tend to start things out, you know, why does this matter? Why do we care about this? And I would argue that water is probably the single most underappreciated operational risk and potential operational constraint. And I suspect we'll have some debate a little bit down the road here on the panel about this. But if you think about some of the dimensions you're dealing with, there's a huge logistical and costs flow from that. At the same time, there's a big economic opportunity that's potentially created for various parties by that. And I think that'll be a story of, of, of scale and of infrastructure in many cases, as much as it is about technology. I think a lot of this augurs toward maximizing the capture of the resource, some of the dynamics that uh, Joe was mentioning. And then there are huge social license factors, because if you're in the Permian, I think something that is a great advantage relative to operating in, for instance, the Utica or the Marcellus or some of these other areas is there's a much deeper and broader acceptance of industry activities. But if you have a spill of water that can be several times saltier than seawater, that can grind a halt pretty fast. Now, as we, as we think about some of the stakes here, you know, first let's look at the volumetric flows. So with this slide here, basically the, the, the big fat red bar on the bottom is the Permian Basin. You're looking at rates, the, the most recent data that we have reasonably full reporting for, probably on the order of about 125 million barrels of water per month used for fracking. That's Texas and New Mexico. And so you're looking most likely at somewhere between four and four and a half million barrels a day. And to put that into perspective for you, the city of San Antonio, the water use swings a little bit year to year, but that would be four and a half to maybe 5.6 or 5.7 million barrels per day. So you have an all in aggregate water use that is approaching what you'd see from a very large city in Texas. So something very, very significant. If we turn to the chart on the right hand side, that is total water injection. Some of this will be disposal and some of this will also be for enhanced oil recovery projects. It's not directly attributed in the data, but kind of what I use as a, as a separator is if you look on the, on the left hand of that, that is the Permian Basin back in 2007, 2008 in essence, before the horizontal drilling and, and fracking boom really took off. And if you look at the, the difference between that and, and some of the volumes we've seen more recently, that comes out to somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think, around 5 million barrels a day that you could reasonably attribute to unconventional oil and gas development, uh, just as, as that some of our other panelists are actually involved in turning drill bits on. And if you think about kind of the, the growth leverage ratio going forward is the rule of thumb, I think, in the Delaware Basin right now is give or take four barrels of water for each barrel of oil produced. And in the Midland Basin, it'd be about two to one. So as this production growth that John and the others have referenced, if that comes to pass, you have a commensurate multiplied volume of water that's coming with that that you have to deal with. And this slide here, I, I, I've grappled for a while. I thought, okay, we can talk barrels all day long, but what we're really dealing with at some level is a mass problem. And I could come out to you and say, okay, when we look at all the inputs and then all the crude and water and liquids and everything that come out of a long lateral well, we're probably looking at at least 400,000 metric tons over the well's life. And I think these numbers are conservative, but that's a big number. Maybe it's not very anchored or meaningful. To make that a little bit more meaningful, the Empire State Building weighs 340,000 metric tons. So a single well, and again, under fairly conservative recovery and production assumptions, you'd be looking at about one and a quarter Empire State Building's worth of mass. And we have about 500 rigs running at any given time in the basin now. So you start to, you start to do the math on that, and about 80% of that mass that you have to move comes from water. And just to translate that tonnage into what it would be if you had to truck it is, I think it'd, it'd be over 11,000 truckloads. 
So when you think about how this redounds to road safety, where we have death rates now that, based on the data I've run, probably exceed those in Ru of Russia on a per capita basis in the core Texas Permian Basin counties, you've got real issues here, but you also have a real case, both from the economic perspective and also from the responsible operator perspective for doing some of these pipeline and, and water midstream investments. Now, to bring a little bit more perspective, we'll often see these breathless news headlines where we talk about hundreds of millions of gallons or millions of barrels, things that sound like just absolutely enormous volumes of water that are being used for fracking. So I thought I would anchor those a little bit for you. And so I took, uh, Pat, I don't know if we have anyone from Encana here today, but a big pad drilling development they did south of Midland, 33 wells, about 11 million barrels of water pumped. That sounds like a tremendous number. If you put it in farm terms, that would irrigate 1,000 acres of cotton for one growing season. So it's meaningful, but it's not nearly as big as it might sound at first glance. And when I looked at the Midland residential water consumption data, it's roughly enough water to supply around 2,600 households for a year. And so it's meaningful, but I think it's useful to have this perspective as we situate frack water use versus agriculture and versus cities. And, you know, it, it, it starts to help us understand both how this fits at a macro level, and it also helps you understand how intense the local impacts of that water use can be and help us start thinking about ways that we might optimize that so that we can keep the oil production up and that we can hopefully free up fresh water for other uses. Now, just to put a single well, and th this is from actual well data from a, a completion that was done in, in 2017 in southeast New Mexico, the peak day of flowback just from this single well, once it was brought online, we'd be able to submerge the floor of this room under about 10 feet of water. And so you're, you're talking fairly, fairly significant volumes. If you float it back for 90 days, you know, if you actually aggregate this data up, you could fill about 19 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And when we come back to the pad drilling that many of the operators, I suspect even including some on the panel here, are already deeply engaged in, you can have a pad with five wells, six wells, seven wells, or in some cases into the double digits. And so it starts to help you appreciate the level of logistical challenge that, that, that we're dealing with. But what, what the good news is out of this, though, is with that challenge, there's a commensurate opportunity. We did an analysis earlier this summer. I, I took a look. I said, OK, what would we have to potentially get to to justify a billion dollar market valuation for a water midstream company? You start thinking about the kind of numbers that, that Wall Street, that some of the big private equity investors and so forth might be interested in. And what I came out under my initial assumptions, which I think some of my fellow panelists might shoot a few arrows at me for, but I'll go ahead and put them out here, is you'd be looking at a water system that starts to roughly approximate the volumes that the city of Midland moves each day between drinking water distribution and sewage collection, something on the order of 550 to maybe 650,000 barrels of water per day, depending on how, how you distribute between uh, filling frack pits and gathering produced water and what kind of earnings multiple you attach to that. And so basically something on the order of what a city of 150,000 people would use per day in an oil boom. So pretty, pretty large numbers there. And if you adjust this out to certain other scenarios, the numbers will flip in various ways based on your assumptions. But I think if we tie this back to that first slide as we're looking at the volumes, the sense you start to get fairly quickly is with the amount of water moving around. There's a pretty significant economic opportunity, and there's already a lot of players working to exploit this, but I think we're still in early innings there, and there's an enormous amount of headroom to go. And for me, I guess I'm, I'm a technology optimist, but I'm also an infrastructure and scale optimist, and I think that's the road we're heading down with water management in the Permian. Okay. What are the other challenges, folks? Um, and put the water challenge in perspective for us. Is where does that rank, uh, Joe and Amir, in the on the list of challenges that y'all are facing day to day out in the Permian? Yeah, maybe we jumped the gun on some of the 
challenges up front, but uh, water is certainly a, a, a big issue, and it has been for us since, since day one. I mean, when we started drilling uh, horizontally out here, it was about sourcing water to, to frack these wells, right? You're talking at least two, 300,000 barrels of water uh, when you're doing the hydraulic fracturing, and it, it can, has continued to grow over time. But our, our biggest focus starting out was, well, we need to source this water. And it became very clear that sourcing fresh water was not the way to go, right? You're going to start uh, depleting um, water levels and water tables uh, across cities, which, you know, you obviously don't want to be doing. So we started going to, to uh, more brackish, deeper zones in the Santa Rosa and using that. Make sure you had the compatibility right with the rest of your frack uh, design. But that's where it started, but it's, it's quickly morphed to disposal. And, you know, we, we, we see this every day, and we've been seeing this for, for a long time. We invested in our own saltwater disposal facilities. It was a, a part of our asset and value chain that we wanted to control because we'll, we'll go back and, and talk about the, the, the history of the Permian. It's been, you know, producing for um, many, many years. But water disposal has been going on, and even though we've just moved to horizontal development, water disposal has been going on since the, you know, when we started out here uh, drilling uh, some of these hydraulic fracturing and, and, and uh, putting formation water back into the ground. So we had a, a system of saltwater disposal facilities that were in more shallower zones. I mean, they're well bef below water tables, but they're getting pressured up. Right, so and you might have heard about this. It became a big issue last year um, around some surprises in the industry because when you pressure up those zones, they're shallower. We're drilling through those to get to deeper zones to uh, to develop, and they create uh, enormous drilling challenges. You have these differential pressures downhole and, and create some issues. So we sort of went down the path of well, we don't want to be using these shallow uh, disposal zones. We want to get to deeper zones that, uh, where we can. It costs more money. You got to use uh, a lot of geoscience to find conventional traps that have been depleted to put these water volumes in. And we, we target a zone called the Ellenberger in the Midland Basin. But it was critical for us because we didn't want to rely on some of this third party infrastructure that's out there. I, I agree it's an enormous opportunity set. Now, if I'll contrast that with the Delaware Basin in contrast with the, the Midland Basin, it's deeper, it's deeper, it's pressured, and it's got a lot more complexity in terms of faulting and, and uh, potential for seismicity. So going to deeper zones in the Delaware aren't, isn't going to be as, as much of an option. Uh, it's going to be cost prohibitive, and a lot of the regulatory agencies aren't per permitting deep uh, permits for, for those types of wells. So we have to be creative. So one of the things that we're doing in the Delaware is because we can't take advantage of that opportunity that we did in the Midland to reliably put volumes away. We've teamed up with a, a midstream partner who's taken advantage of this named Goodnight Midstream. And they've built a pipeline for about 12 miles, taking water away from our fields to the central basin platform, away from our fields and other development that's out there and being more nimble, right? We have to continue to find ways to be smart around these types of issues. But ultimately, where we need to go is recycling water. There, there's absolutely no question we need to recycle water, uh, not only from an economic standpoint, but from an environmental standpoint. We're doing that, right? We, uh, in, in our Delaware uh, operations, we're running two rigs um, out there in Ward County. We have a, a million barrel uh, recycle pit that we've put in place. Um, and we're recycling today about 50% of our uh, volumes we need for our fracks. We hope to get that closer to 100 uh, going forward. But Again, there's going to be a huge economic benefit because to recycle water, if you keep the water moving, it's about 25 cents a barrel. To do, if, if you needed to source water, depending on what your source is, could be 50 cents, could be up to a dollar. To work with a commercial disposal facility, could be a dollar. And even if you then if you truck it, it's another couple dollars. So you could sense if you take away that part of the, the economics in, in recycling water, not only is it the, the, the responsible thing to do, but there's some big economic advantages which usually get people to fall into line, uh, which is a good thing. But um, 
that was my, my views on, on, the, on the water side. And maybe Amir, if you want to talk about that and, and we can hit some of the other challenges. Absolutely. I think, um, Gabe, uh, it's not throwing an arrow. First of all, <laughs> I, I think um, you could have used a, uh, a Callan or a Shell example and it would could, probably the numbers would have looked slightly better than the, the Incana example that you've showed here. But, um, <laughs> Tell uh, me which uh, badge you want me to use. <laughs> um, so, so I'll, I'll come to the recycling piece, but I think you know the, the way we view it is, is it, it is absolutely an issue. I think we're going to run out of injection space sooner or later. This this problem is not going to go away. The the one to four ratio, one barrel of oil to four barrels of water, is is the nominal now, but that trend is actually increasing. And as we go to development of the cube, which is the multi layers, it's not going to get any easier. Um, so we see that as, you know, by mid-2020s, I think we're going to be in a situation that we need to get that water out of the basin. The disposal um, options will, will run out of disposal options. And this is something that we need to work with the regulatory bodies with. Um, at the moment, treatment and reuse is, um, is, is allowed by exception. We cannot, um, e even if you get it to a, a spec that you can use it for non-crop irrigation, that's also not allowed in Texas. Um, but here's my here's my, my dream, and uh, I think you know mid 2020s we will be taking a lot of that produced water from from Permian into 25 inch 26 inch lines to the Gulf Coast to old deep water facilities that are actually not producing anymore, and you're injecting in that reservoir. That's I think this is this is one way. I don't tell that to my deep water colleagues; they don't like to hear that story. Uh, but but that, that's going to be the issue. We will not have voided space to inject in the, in the uh, particularly in the, in the Delaware. The other issue is um, we actually need to, to attack that at, at, the, at, the, at the essence of the problem. The amount of water that we use for frac um, really depends on the operator. I mean, there is a belief that the more water you use to frac, the more you can recover from the reservoir. That's not where everybody uh, looks at that. Um, it, it, our view, for example, that we use half the water that, that the example that Gabe has, uh, has, has shown here in, in our frack, which means that we use more sand, so a, a higher sand loading than, than water. But we also get less water back uh, when we start producing that well. Uh, at the moment, we're running at around 40, 40 to 50 percent of recycling, and by the end of 2020, we'll be uh, 90 percent recycled water in the frack. You can never reach 100 percent because there is an, a part of the drilling operations that you have to use um, not produce water, so clean water uh, or brackish water in, in, in your um, uh, completion, drilling and completion operations. So you will have coverage for 100%, but you'll probably be able to use 90%. That's where the, the industry is going. The, the, the challenge now, uh, which is quite an interesting one, that business is actually booming, indeed, as, as Gabe said. Um, landowners are actually objecting, uh, objecting to recycling. This is, this is their source of income uh, to sell you groundwater. That, that's, that's the main source of their income. That's surface owners, right, versus mineral owners. That's why we get um, some of these challenges between what we want to do in terms of recycling and reusing a lot of our produced water versus what an industry um, or, or, or a, a, um, the, 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 the surface owners would see as an opportunity to extract, uh, extract value. Um, the last thing I would say around water is actually, to me, water is not my first challenge. I think what um, it, it, is, it is the second, but to me it's um, the road issues that we face in, in the Permian. Um, just to be clear, one of the things that we ultimately need to work on as, a, as an industry is how much of that water is transported through pipe. Getting to that 99% water in pipe is absolutely critical. At the moment, we're actually probably as an industry, 60% of our water is in pipe and the rest is transported through trucks, which is leading to significant safety issues. We get a fatality in the Permian every 29 hours. One death in the Permian in the 16 counties that house the Permian Basin every 29 hours. That part of Texas houses 2% uh, of the population and gets over 15% of the fatalities in the state of Texas. That's extremely unacceptable. So if there's anything that will probably constrain or prohibit our growth, getting to that five to six million barrels, it's actually, it could be water, but I think we're gonna find a solution because once one company cracks that nut, everybody else will follow. The one nut that we will struggle to crack individually is actually our infrastructure, our roads particularly, because it needs one bad player to spoil it to everybody. And that's, I think it's, it's when, when you compare it to anywhere in, in the world, this is the second most dangerous region 
in terms of road safety in the world, in our industry. Yeah, and that's only, we talk about the, the water side of trucking, but <clears throat> in terms of the, the, the sand that we use to frack these wells, historically we took a lot from northern, what we call northern white Wisconsin, some upper Midwest, and, and railed them in. But there's an immense uh, amount of development of local sands, the brown sands out in, in the, uh, the Permian that are coming online. It's, it's cheaper. We as an industry, again, going back to technology, we've gotten our head around, we can use uh, some of these local sands. They don't have quite the, the strong of crush properties um, to, for, for fracking, but w there's a lot of testing going on, especially in shallower zones that aren't as overpressured, seeing an opportunity to use local sands. But again, these are all getting trucked, right? They, they're not coming in on r rails. They're moving from uh, you know, places in, in, the, in the Delaware Basin and finding homes all across the Permian, just adding again to, to more trucks on the road and exacerbating the problem that, that Amir talked about. So, so just to maybe ask you guys a question based on, I mean, so you think, I mean, so Gabe's theory that you, you may differ on the multiples, but uh, the idea that of kind of the midstream water company, you know, the size and scale that could have, I mean, you think that that's, that's viable and that we'll see some, some of that occur? It's occurring. I mean, yeah. there, there's, there's companies lined up to, to take these entities public a, a, as we speak. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's hard, you know, investor community needs to get their head around what, how sustainable is this for the future when you have a push for recycling or push for, you know, taking it out of the basin and, and, and uh, disposing it in different areas. Um, because there's going to be a push very quickly to do that, right? Right now, we're using shallow saltwater disposal, you know, wherever we can just because out of necessity, right? Uh, but I, I agree there's going to be an opportunity, but I think it's going to take a, a real clear vision for these midstream, you know, how am I going to evolve as that business model evolves over, over time? Yeah. I I'm going to step in for just a second because we've had a couple of potential clients come to us interested in, in doing water projects out in, in the producing areas. And one of the problems they run into when you look at that cycle of bringing in, bringing in fresh water, mm -hmm. then taking away the wastewater, recycling, and then re-delivering the recycled water, almost every one of those steps um, is treated as a different kind of entity under Texas water regulation. Um, the water regulations in Texas are a fractured mess, um, which is great for a regulatory lawyer, but it's not so great for people who are actually trying to get something done. Um, and that's, that's been a real problem for folks who have actively been looking at those kinds of projects, but one of the problems they run into is just the, the multiplicity of different types of regulated entities, entities that would have to be involved. Some of them have eminent domain, if you need that to get to run your pipelines, some of them don't. Some of them they have different types of rate regulation. And you've probably got, I think you've got at least three agencies that you're going to be dealing with in the TCEQ, which is the Environmental Agency, the Railroad Commission, uh, and the Public Utility Commission, which now regulates the water rates. So it's, it's a bit of a mess for the folks who are trying to do that. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Gabe. Go ahead. Oh, well, no, I, I actually had a question for the other panelists, I think in particular Joe and Amir. Is, what type of appetite do you see for potentially building shared infrastructure? I think this, the case is, is quite, I mean, we already do it with crude and gas effectively through some of the midstreams. I think we're seeing it more with water, but even I was just thinking about your sand remarks and, you know, you think about if you're in the Northern Delaware Basin where the mines are and you're somewhere in the Midland Basin or Southern Delaware Basin in a hot activity area, has anybody considered something, you, know, you see these central logistics hubs for other goods, maybe you collaborate on some way to move sand in bulk, you know, a rail spur or whatnot, people co-invest, and then you still have to truck, but at least your last mile is the last five miles instead of the last 50, you know, things like that. Absolutely, Gabe. I think this is inevitable. I think we're gonna, um, we're gonna see more central distribution um, whether you get it, the sand out of or the propane out of, out of state into a central, using rail to a central location, and then you do your final mile uh, through distribution. Um, if, if this was a, a play where you have five or six companies, you would see that. The challenge we have, we have 100 companies, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, and I think it takes a, um, a group of, of operators to collaborate and put some seed thinking, seed money into some of these thoughts. Um, we, um, we are um, 
working with a group of uh, operators in the Permian Basin to establish a, uh, a strategic partnership. It's a, um, um, the, the top 20 operators in the basin, and this is exactly one of their, one of their initiatives. We will not build this, uh, but we will actually make sure that there is an investment case that supports the funding and financing of such um, infrastructure um, operations. I think just going back to the water, um, I'm not sure if a produce water company, disposal company, is going to be viable in the long term. I think the opportunity for sourcing water was there and is there, mm. but from a, a disposal, the challenge with disposal is whoever has the control on your water to dispose actually has control on your production, right? And that, that just tends to drive companies and operators, you know, big and small, to actually protect that that piece because that's really your 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 lifeline um, in terms of uh, produce water. But having um, the right regulatory framework to look at multiple disposal methods, including treatment, surface discharge, piping and disposing outside state, recycling and reuse, that's absolutely essential. And just to maybe weigh in on the collaboration question a little bit, I mean, the other thing that, that I think we're starting to see, and some of this is kind of coming from the you know, the digital revolution we're having is that I think that's bringing people together a little bit more to talk about how can we, you know, do centralized logistics, centralized supply um, on some of these things. Um, you know, we have clients that talk about, you know, why shouldn't there be an, an Amazon of, of oil field service and products, right? right. And, and, and why aren't we able to, to be able, you know, better access that uh, digitally and have that kind of customer interaction? And, and, you know, I think for that to happen, though, it's going to take some collaboration um, um, among the players t to get there. But I think, you know, if you think about it, I think there's enormous efficiencies to, to still be gained in terms of, I mean, just even the really basics of supply chain and logistics, um, you know, it's still somewhat clunky or, or across across the basin. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. To, to what extent do you think we're fighting maybe the old legacy of industry secrecy? Because you think about the days where you had such exploration risk and so forth, maybe it was more in your interest to be secretive. And now I, it seems like we're going to something that's almost kind of the way Toyota is with manufacturing cars, where it's actually very open about how it does things because it's so hard to execute on them. And it would seem, you know, guys like y'all that have accumulated premium acreage positions and are getting really good at exploiting it, that there is a case for a lot more openness and collaboration. And I guess I wonder how much of this is just maybe pushing back against decades and decades of culture that in many ways kind of pushed you the opposite way. Yeah, I think we, we've seen, cultural shifts on that front, you know, and, and maybe we'll take the Permian, for example, they talked about that, that land grab that went on for, for a while. And now that, you know, for the most part, certainly in core areas, a lot of that acreage is accounted for. And we're all trying to figure out how we can be efficient. One way is that we'll swap acreage with each other to, to form longer laterals, which are directionally more capital efficient. Uh, but in terms of technology and, and thinking about ways to be efficient. We're seeing a lot of consortiums that, that pop up, whether that's bilateral in terms of swapping uh, well data and, and, you know, in an effort to, to refine completion designs to broader industry consortiums. You know, there's some that are more formalized. Uh, a company called Core Labs has a, has a consortium that if you, you drill a, a vertical well, you take a core sample, right? You take hundreds of feet of, of core and that, you know, the rock properties there have it analyzed, but you can share that data. You have to make a commitment to, to contribute cores to this consortium. But there's some formal, there's some more informal, but I, I think I, I've seen over the last three or four years a lot more of that willingness to, to share. Okay. Yeah, and, and if I may just build on, on Joe's comments, I think it's going to be a data game. Um, I'll tell you a story. We were um, um, about a year and a half ago when I um, started my my work on the Permian Basin, um, I was leading an initiative in Shell, which is the, the shale field of the future, and, and the concept was very simple. What, you know, what does the field of the future look like? Uh, we actually codenamed it iShale, and we trademarked it, not because of anything, but we thought the name will be catchy, so we put a, a, a registered trademark on it. Um, but the concept was how do we operate and how do we create a field that is completely different from what we see today? And we brought a number of strategic partners together, big suppliers, small suppliers, to see how can we operate completely without the need to have a human being on site for a month, right? Yeah. Today, this business is so labor intensive. 
each operator has to go and see their wells every, every other day, at least. Um, but it was very easy because we said, you know, we're not going to IP this concept because if you've been to the Permian, you can cross the road and you can visit five companies just driving your truck around. There is some potential for trespassing, but there is no fences and walls. There's no cameras either. You know, some operators started now putting some surveillance cameras, but it's really open. So protecting and putting everything in a black box and putting an IP on it, was it, was it clear? So this company came along and said, well, actually, well, actually, we'll tell you where to drill your next well. We're going to sweet spot this using satellite. And we're going to monitor the <coughs> amount of water and trucks and sand and proper, and that's going to go by high definition digital imagery from satellites, cube satellites. These are $20,000, you know, small satellites that are launched on the back of uh, um, at trips to, to space, and we're going to tell you where to drill the next well. And actually, we did a, a little experiment to check, are they, are they really right? Could they do that? And yes, I think, I think data is going to become um, the, the secret of, of, of this, um, this, this revolution, artificial intelligence and um, predictive analytics, and machine learning. This is, this is what I think, you know, by 2025 we will be in. Would you guys think more about in-house in this, or is this something where maybe we see broader collaboration with the Silicon Valley crowd, which I think so far is probably almost to the industry's detriment that there hasn't been more overlap between the two? Well, I mean, I'd comment that I think they're starting to be more. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me how often, um, you know, one of our core services is all around digital and helping companies implement digital technology. Um, and, you know, the amount of interest in the number of times we're doing kind of these digital fluency labs and bringing clients and, you know, they don't want to just hear what the other oil companies are doing. They want to go to talk to Google and they want to talk to Apple. Um, because, you know, I think, for, and I think it's positive, and I think the downturn helped with this, frankly, because I think, you know, I, I believe, you know, markets force innovation, and I think people said, we, we've, we've got to innovate, and we've got to look outside, and, and they're doing that more than ever. So, you know, I think it's been a bit of an insular uh, community in the past, but I think that's changing, and we're seeing some, some, some interesting things, and I think we'll continue to see that. I mean, I think we're, you know, if this is a baseball game, I think we're in, you know, maybe the second inning, but it's, uh, it was a long first inning, right. but it's, uh, right. it's right. it wasn't a, it wasn't a Verlander first inning. It was more of a Keuchel first inning for, for, <laughs> those, for those of you with base Astros references. I want to bring us a little bit back to geology and discussing geology because John started saying that it's one big oil field and it's actually a basin, it's not the field. And acreage grab was important because there are sweet spots and there are not so sweet spots. And there are a lot of gainers, but uh, there are a lot of losers in this game too. Uh, so the average numbers also averaging uh, things over uh, Bayesian could be very challenging and may lead us to wrong assumptions and conclusions. And uh, about digital revolution and AI and the rest of this stuff. Um, this is great opportunity if uh, the data is looked in at the um, proper context, not taking out of the context. Um, and what I see people to save money is stop collecting certain data. So, for example, people saving money not collecting log data. People saving money by not getting correct data. Um, uh, there are uh, collision issues, right? There is proper uh, surveying that should be done in the basin. So uh, could you comment on, um, on this, please? Because, I mean, AI is only good. I'm afraid that people will throw away AI soon because um, it's nothing wrong with tool. It's how we use it. And everybody is rush, uh, rushing right now, and Shell spend a lot of money on studying AI. Um, and um, uh, for many years, Shell was doing it. And uh, the conclusions often that uh, there is so much information and so much noise in the results that hard to extract the result. So I would like your comments about that. Joe, you want to take that? You're a geologist? <laughs> I think she mentioned <laughs> Shell. Oh, right. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but you're, you're absolutely right. I think, I think we swung the pendulum a little bit too far. We went from a lot of data, a lot of rich data, 100 operators drilling, you know, bringing online a well every day, to saying, well, the data is coming actually from my next door neighbor. Do I really need? I'm going to see it in six months' time because I'm going to see the log in six months' time. Do I really need to collect all that? To um, to somewhere where we're actually not collecting any data, right? Because we feel it's a um, 
it's a cookie cutter, right? We're going to do 13 wells, 12 wells per section or 18 wells per section. One of the wells is not going to be good, but the rest is, is, is going to be okay. Now, we're not, we're not in that space at all. Um, our biggest concern is shallow hazards, as you, you probably know, in the basin. With, even within one section, which is a mile by mile, you can drill four wells. In this, on the same pad, and well number five, you can lose the, the top hole because you have a, um, you know, a, a water risk or you can have an H2S pocket. So in terms of, uh, of, of, of data, for us, it's, a lot of it is to make sure we drill and deliver the safest well. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of it is, is um, making sure, like the, the example I gave, the well that we're about to spud is actually going to use everything that we are collecting while drilling, all the porosity, permeability, all the um, uh, properties of the rock to actually keep us within zone as much as, as possible. Um, and it also helps us, and that was really part of the driver, is that we're not going to have to work two shifts with geologists si sitting in the office and not sleeping overnight. We actually can do that with a machine, and the geologist will be there in the morning to make sure that the trajectory is, uh, is, is being, being maintained. Um, so I think we're, we're bringing the pendulum back where data has to be collected in specific areas, specific zones compared, but the ownership of data is absolutely critical. Yeah. Now, coming from from the other angle, you know, if, if smaller operators might might be biased to well, you know, we're not going to spend a lot of money on, on data capture, and and we'll try to rely on industry sources. But I think, you know, some of the smaller companies like ourselves are starting to see the power of it, right? We, we have started collecting data, whether it's from offset operators and seeing the power of some of the predictive analytics that we know that we have to spend the money. It might slow you down in terms of cycle times to collect some of this data. There's a cost to it. But we as an industry really need to collect. So I think you're going to see more of that, especially when engineers that are uh, opening their eyes to the, these new concepts and, and things that Amir was talking about, seeing the power of it, because there is a lot of variability. You can have a well that's, that's here and 600 feet uh, offsetting could be completely different, right? The mineralogy could change very quickly and you'll have a very different well. So you got to have enough data to explain why that, that difference is. So when you go out and, and see that again um, while, you're measure, while you're drilling and, and, and taking data, maybe you see an anomaly that the next time you see it, you'll do something different. But I think you'll, you'll see a lot more investment from the smaller and mid-sized companies as well um, in this and leveraging data in the right way. Good afternoon. My name is Hamed Hamedi I'm Innovation Manager at Accenture. I would like to um, uh, take your um, uh, get your take on this concept like uh, water less fracking using foam uh, liquid CO2 injection uh, in order to reduce not significantly eliminate water at least reduce the amount of water that we inject into this well are they practical are they pragmatic economical feasible for a Permian basin thank you thank you thank you Hamid um so, so, so the purpose of the water is actually this is the carrier for the for the propane. That's the carrier for the sand. So effectively, you just need any fluid that would carry the propane. Uh, but also, you want to make sure that you have the most abundant, you know, propane carrier. Um, and there's there's um, a number of trials we've done with non-aqueous uh, fracking, so gel, um, and a couple of trials that we're actually working with in in, in Shell. That unfortunately, I cannot disclose at the moment. Uh, but so far, we have not seen anything that is more cost effective than uh, recycled water. Um, with a little bit of treatment to make sure that this water does not destroy any of the jewelry in the well that you put through and, and, and inhibit corrosion, um, we, don't, we don't think that we have found anything that is more, more available. Now, water is also very abundant in an area like uh, West Texas. And if you're getting a lot of water back, why don't you just reuse it and frack with it versus you know disposing it, injecting it, and bringing some other form of um, foam or gel or um, any other any other um, carrier for the for the propane. Other areas, other unconventional um, basins, we might have to do something like that where water is really uh, a commodity and, and scarce. But in West Texas, I don't see just given the abundance uh, any you know any more viable alternative. Yeah, we we agree with that. I mean, we we've done some testing with you know linear gels and, and cross-link gels that you know 
allow you to obviously not be pumping as much water. And with these higher viscosity type of concepts, we, we just haven't seen the same performance. But you know, there's concepts of, of hybrid um, as well that you can st start and propagate a, a frac stage with a slick water and move to a gel to put the volumes in at the, at the end of the, that, that stage, which gets a little bit harder from a pressure standpoint. But uh, overall, I think water's you know, what we've seen to be the most uh, impactful. Let me start down here with Gabe and ask each of you to take two or three minutes and tell us what you think is sort of, we've talked about a lot of the challenges, we've touched on some of the opportunities. What do you think is one of the biggest opportunities um, present in the Permian today? I think I've probably already showed most of the cards in my deck on this between <laughs> what I've said here so far and what I've written, but to me, I think technology in some instances is maybe almost secondary to scale and optimization because like for instance if you're talking about moving these things at the end of the day or bulk commodities the more cheaply you can do that in a repeatable and sustainable way and then you mate that with technology for kind of the very pointy end of the spear when you're figuring out how to stimulate one zone or one stage over the next that to me it seems to be an area where there's probably still a lot of headroom and I suspect that some of the consolidation that is likely to come and that has already happened will facilitate that. John? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I guess what I'd really focus on is just optimization and, and really in two aspects. For, as I mentioned, I still think there's a lot of room for optimization in terms of um, just even some fairly blocking and tackling things around supply and logistics. Um, there's still a lot of um, inefficiencies there. And I think just applying, you know, th there's a lot of really fairly easy fixes to some of that if, if we have the data to understand, you know, how, how materials and services are being ordered, moved um, around. So, you know, I think applying some of the digital technologies out there can help really on that side of things. The other side we haven't really touched on is just the realization side of it and optimizing uh, the hydrocarbons once you once you actually produce them. Uh, I still think there's room for, for more optimization there. I mean, we talk a lot about the constraints, um, but, but even just thinking about, you know, finding the optimal home for, for those hydrocarbons um, and getting optimal realizations is, is important. Um, I still think that there's improvements that can be done, at least based on my what I've seen um, uh, in terms of how we do that, finding kind of the best markets for those, uh, finding, you know, optimal movement on the, the various midstream infrastructure. Um, all of those have been, you know, problematic for a lot of our clients. And so I think there's still a lot of room for improvement on that front. Yeah, I, I, probably in a similar vein, just it's around, I think, realized efficiencies as you move towards uh, more program development uh, in the basin, which means larger pad uh, designs, right? Instead of putting one or two wells on a single pad, you're talking about six, ten, e e even more, right? So there's some surface synergies that you'll, you'll realize, you'll realize some supply chain. Uh, benefits from that and, and sort of concentrating activity uh, a, a bit more. I, I think there's a lot to come from uh, the service side. You know, we talk about technology and talk about reservoir characterization and, and, and the impact that's had on, on capturing the resource. But, you know, what we're seeing, um, you know, outside of AI and some of these things that are a little bit more black box uh, to some degree, but if you take completion crews, for instance, what we're seeing real tangible evidence of technology coming to bear in terms of efficiencies there with some of the larger companies monitoring their completion fleets remotely. And, you know, historically we'd have, you know, the, the people working those completion crews looking at pressure gauges as you're, you know, pumping this enormous amount of uh, fluid downhole under different pressures and they're reading gauges and they're using a naked eye to figure out if there's problems. And now we've evolved to centralized centers that they're, they're monitoring the gauges remotely, but also you, know, you, can, you can sense vibrations in pumps and, and be predictive in terms of how to maintain things. So I think you're gonna see efficiencies continue to, uh, to bear fruit, which is only gonna help our competitiveness on the, the global landscape in terms of moving further down the, the marginal uh, cost curve as well. So, so I, th I think there's, there's three opportunities. I think it's integration, technology, and scale. I think this is where, where 
the biggest and largest impact that we will have on the industry. So now let me just briefly touch on this. So technology, I think we, we talked about it, and I, I don't think, I think we're in the first inning when it comes to that, that piece in, in my view. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, the vision that we have for, for the Permian, not just Shell, but I think for the, for the basin uh, wide, um, I, think, I think over the next five years, we're going to see what I call Uberization of the, of the shale business, uh, where it is not going to be human intense, not because we would like to reduce the efficiency or not, not because we don't think that uh, we will need people anymore. I think the, the growth that we have in the basin is going to outpace any resource qualification built that, that you will have. You will not have people, enough people, to actually do what they need to do today. Um, so that's where I see technology. We, uh, we're looking at a drone application beyond line of sight. As you all know, we use drone in the industrial sector as long as you can keep an eye on it and you can see it. But we don't use drones to fly anything beyond your line of sight. And we've got the first approval from the Federal Aviation Authority together with a, uh, uh, Avitas, which is a company owned by GE, to actually do one route of an operator to collect data and to uh, monitor um, our operations, look at tank levels. Um, for 60 miles, collect samples, air samples, soil samples as well. Uh, just imagine that you don't have any more operators driving vehicles on the roads, but you can do that surveillance, that route, all, all with, a, with a drone. And that's just the beginning. I think that's just scratching, scratching the surface. We talked a lot about data, but I think technology is going to probably be the, the biggest game changer. Uh, the piece around integration is, is linking the value from your wellhead all the way to your customer. Uh, whether it's an oil stream, whether it's a gas stream, whether it's an NGL, I think linking that and securing that value chain from the wellhead all the way to your, even your, your export partners is going to be the, um, the biggest game changer in, 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 in terms of um, making sure that you don't have any value leakage um, outside that, uh, that, that business. And then thirdly, it's scale. A lot of what we talked about will only work if we have scale. Um, even if we look at uh, the technology application, uh, we, have, we have a number of, uh, of, of companies still do flare uh, gas just because the gas system is not available uh, or because they don't have access to gas infrastructure or because they only have five or six well pads. It does not really you know, make sense or economic sense to build that. But the regulatory framework will allow them to actually flare. We stopped flaring, uh, routine flaring in, in our operation. We don't have any flares installed in our well sites anymore. But that only is happening because we are building that scale. And similar to Callan, when you have the scale, when you have the consolidation, you can actually make investment in infrastructure that will help your carbon footprint at the end. So we've got a lot to do in, in scale, integration, and I think technology in, 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 that, in that business. Question. Yeah, George Frank, uh, Quanta Factors, LLC. Uh, my question, uh, if a comment first, is uh, thank you for the excellent uh, presentations and the comments you guys have made so far. Um, the first one is, how do you guys see uh, for, your, uh, produce, for your produced water? Do you guys use uh, flocculation agglomeration techniques to treat the water before you dispose it? And then second off is a comment, if any, what do you think the factor of produced water, uh, treatment of produced water, affects negative free cash flow for very small or minor players in the Permian, or even maybe big players like you? How much do you think the effect of uh, managing or treating your water affects the free cash flow for the company? So when your balance sheet? Thank you. Yeah, um, so I think Joe t touched on it. The, um, the amount of treatment you need to dispose in certain reservoirs, um, you, know, you don't need to go to a, a 10 ppm type of, of, of um, um, uh, treatment. You need that when you are looking at surface disposal like in other states outside Texas. Um, so it's, it's actually quite um, efficient. Um, you know, it's all less than a dollar when you're treating your produced water, including injection costs for power. Um, we've, um, we've looked at additional treatment capacities. The issue with treatment plants, they only become efficient when you are building um, anything like 10,000 barrels a day. But after that, you have to, the, the scaling it to make it efficient is quite huge because these treatment plants are actually quite big. Um, so the disposal does not require 
as, um, as much treatment as, as you've mentioned for surface disposal. Um, and I think a lot of the um, you know, small and big companies, um, the way they want to handle produced water it really depends on how critical that that management of that chain is, is important. In Shell, we, we don't utilize third party to manage our produced water. We have 13 uh, salt water disposal plants and 25 wells. That's enough to take most of our produced water for the next you know, two years. But we're thinking, okay, that's, that's just not going to be enough. And disposing and injecting in the Delaware is not going to be the solution that we will be looking at in, in 10 years from now. It's a, it's, a, it's a very meaningful economic impact, for, as you uh, alluded to, and I talked a little bit about some of the economics. And uh, Again, on the disposal side, we, we control a good portion of our saltwater disposal uh, facilities, so to operate it, um, you know, leave recycling aside, it's probably 25 to 40 cents. Then you have to pay the surface owner. You know, there's royalties associated with it, but it's probably 50 cents if you do it on your own. To go to a third party, if you're connected by pipe, could be 60 cents to a dollar. But it, it, when you talk, talk about trucking and competing in a very competitive trucking market, you get to a couple dollars to, to all in to do that. But it, it also gets to the economics. And Mir, I think you mentioned the, we're in the water moving business in a lot of ways, right? So if you don't control your own destiny on that piece of it, that's a huge part of it. It's hard to quantify that. Um, I can quantify the difference between owning a saltwater disposal well and using a third-party commercial well. But if, you, if you're constrained because you can't get into a facility, that it's going to cost you a lot of dollars. It's almost, I mean, it's almost existential to some degree, right? You don't, yeah. you don't have a lot of choices. So, yeah, it's interesting. So I have two questions, and they're semi-related. Um, one actually relates to a comment that Jim made. Um, regarding regulatory oversight in the water space in particular. It's different everywhere. So Texas is different than New Mexico, is different than Colorado, and that patchwork is just unimaginably difficult to navigate. But with regard to the adoption and implementation of the kinds of solutions that we're hearing, what sort of efforts or progress is being made on agency coordination in the regulatory sphere to see that these things can actually happen? Uh, and then secondly, um, when you start talking about all these technological opportunities and the things that are actually being done in the field to enhance productivity effectively, you're really talking about making wells uh, effectively that produce more oil at a lower cost, more gas at a lower cost. So evacuation then becomes an issue, access to market. Um, this comes up over and over and again, again in the popular press. Generally, you need the price signal to incentivize infrastructure investment, but what sort of impediments do you see to infrastructure investment down the road? In particular, some of these technological innovations do enhance productivity, if any. Let Jim, me take the you should, Jim, start, I thought you, you okay. should start with the yeah. <laughs> Who was that question to, Ken? Then. <laughs> The first one seems like... Yeah, uh, yeah the great news on, on the regulatory front in Texas is it's actually easier for those three agencies to talk to each other than it is for the commissioners within those agencies to talk to each other just because of the ex parte rules we have. So you're, you, know, you can't have two public utility commissioners just chatting in their office about what they want to do, but it's much easier. Um, and, and, and the agencies do work together. The, the TCEQ, which is the Environmental Regulator, and the Public Utility Commission, I know have a, a memorandum of understanding on how they work together with their sort of split responsibilities. Um, I believe the Public Utility Commission and the Railroad Commission do as well. I won't swear to that one. Um, but those conversations, those conversations do take place. It's, it's still just a bad patchwork, though. I mean, I, I can take a brief step, especially because this is a question I can't evade because I work with Ken, so I might as well go ahead and try to answer. <laughs> so so in, in terms of the regulatory agencies, I, I defer to Jim's expertise. What I would cite is a concrete data point where I've actually gone and pulled data for uh, applications for non-commercial fluid recycling pits, which in plain English means pits that if you're an operator, you can treat produced water for reuse in a frack or something else in the oil field. And when I collated all those up, it came out to close to 90 million barrels of capacity. And so there's clearly a push in this direction. And even as I went through the records that were disclosed to me after I made the request, 
just when you even look at the email timelines, it seems like on the Railroad Commission's part, there's a pretty high degree of responsiveness. So at least just within their agency, this seems to be a priority. So, so let me just add, I think, it's, I think they, if the industry is aligned on a position, the, the regulator would, would generally follow and would, would be supportive. We don't hit a lot of um, challenges. I think the biggest challenges for the, the you know for the regulators, whether it's on the environmental side, whether it's on the um, production side, um, is when the industry split. Um, and I'll I'll give you an example. I, I think um, at the state senate there was uh, a discussion and debate around um, how do we improve safety on the roads in West Texas and those 15 counties. And um, given the constraints on labor, drivers are actually in, in huge shortage. I don't know if you know, but you know, a driver earns around $120,000 a year, excluding overtime. I don't know when they advertise for overtime for drivers. I think that's, that's even tells you, you know, what is the, how desperate, I mean, that, that, that's a challenge. But there's two, two opportunities. There is, there is a, a voice that says, let's reduce the commercial driving license age to 18 to make available more drivers. And there's another view saying, well, no, let's, let's go and, and, and try and, and use B trains, which is two trailers with one driving cabin. When the industry has such a split, then that's where the regulator would, would struggle. And that's why in a, you know, in a basin like the Permian with 100 operators, trying to get this body to talk with one voice is the most difficult, but that's essential if we want to create something that is sustainable, in my view. Let me do this, because we're, we're at about the 15-minute mark. Let's take one question. If the two of y'all will then indulge me, I want to give John just a few minutes to talk about some of the global impacts, and then we'll come back to you two, okay? Question? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for a great discussion. And obviously, Permian Basin deserves its own attention, because at the, it is at the forefront of our conversation. Uh, my request to the panel is if you could give us some global perspective on, uh, on production, on <laughs> gas production. Particularly, I hear many reports about productions in Western Australia. And I know that that area is very rich. And I was a member of Shell um, going back some four or five years. And I was involved in the, uh, when the <laughs> prelude uh, FLNG facility was being developed and designed. I was a member of the team. So I'm very curious if uh, you are involved with what is going on, the advancement in that field in the, in the global stage. Who wants to take that? Yeah, I think you got the softball. Yeah, I, th I think that, I think that <laughs> I, may that, go that, that pretty well with nicely. what I was going to say in terms of global impact. I mean, I, I think you're specific specifically asking a little bit about kind of Australia and, and that, and I can maybe weave that in if, if that's... My, I am wondering because we are taking so much time and so much, um, so many ships and budgets to ship LNG, uh, uh, natural gas to all over the world, but if there are productions nearby, let's say China, for example, they, get, they can get gas from LNG from Australia, Sure, sure. So, 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 you know, maybe just to put in perspective in terms of what um, what I was going to talk about anyhow that I think dovetails with this pretty well is just you know the Permian's impact on on U.S. production growth and then what that's done to kind of our import export um, situation. So I think we got that up there now. Um, yeah, I mean, if you really lo look at it, it's, it's kind of amazing to think where we're at in terms of being a crude exporter today, especially given we had a ban on crude exports for you know most of my lifetime. Um, you, you know, very quickly we're up over you know two million barrels a day. Um, actually, in you know one week this in June we touched over three million barrels a day. So all, all of a sudden the U.S. is a pretty big crude exporter, um, yet at the same time you see our imports still are fairly high, and of course that's largely because of the, the nature of our U.S. refining system, you know, very much built to run, you know, um, heavy sour crudes, so, you know, that's the natural trade, and, and you know, I do, I just will editorialize for a second, you know, you, you hear a lot of talk about energy independence. Um, at the end of the day, all we want is energy, 
security, which really means you know having free trade that allows us to, to make the optimal economic decisions. And the optimal economic decision, for the most part, for the U.S. is you know sell a, at least par, part of our light suite uh, via export and 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 buy heavy and bring it in. I mean that makes sense. It's a good trade and it works well. So um, you know I think that's certainly changing the landscape. At the, at the same time. Um, uh, I guess a couple slides back, so I'm just going to go ahead and slip. Can we go back to? Oh, um, in your just, earlier presentation? No, 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 to the the gas production one, because I think that'll help answer the gentleman's question a little bit better. No, no, no. no so it's in this second. It's in the part. second. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry, it's okay. You got that one? No. You got that one? Next one. That one. There we go. Is that it? Yeah, so, so that's getting into, so, so I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is that, so uh, the Permian, as I mentioned before, putting off a lot of associated gas, that in conjunction with, you know, the Marcellus, which to, to put it in perspective, you know, I, I talk about how big the Permian is in terms of world scale oil um, producing areas. The Marcellus is at least that in terms of gas producing areas. So, it, you know, as a result of this kind of abundance, the U.S. is now a big player in, in LNG export. Um, you know, we don't get into here kind of the economics around that. I think uh, Ken, your panel earlier probably talked about that a little bit. But I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, there's there's some great um, gas assets coming online or have come online out of Australia. But LNG growth looks pretty healthy, and China in particular um, has continued to ramp that up. So you know, I don't think there's any demand issue um, or in, any significant demand issue that doesn't, you know, make um, a lot of the U.S. export that has certainly already come online very viable. And, you know, I think there's probably room for more out of the Gulf Coast. And that'll be part of, you know, part of, I think, the answer to how we take away some of the associated gas out of the Permian. Hopefully that answered kind of your question. So. Um, the, the only other point I'd make, if we flip to that prior slide just real quickly, um, I, I do think it's interesting to just put this all in a kind of perspective about what, where the Permian sits from a production perspective. I mean, so, so, the, so the Permian basically is about at the third, just, just that specific region is about the third largest oil producer in the world now, which is a phenomenal thing to think about um, in terms of you know, where that, where that is and just the global reach and the impact that has on the, on the markets. So, you know, as we think about, you know, supply and demand globally, the Permian on a standalone basis is a huge player in that. Um, you know, people talk about Iran and, you know, Iran putting barrels on or off the market. Um, but just what happens in the Permian has a direct and fairly material impact on the whole global market today. So it's interesting to think about. Okay, we've got a few more minutes. Let's go back to our questions. I think actually you could hit the mic first. Okay. Um, hi, thank you very much for a really interesting discussion. I'm with the University of Texas at Austin, and I would like to shift a little bit the conversation about infrastructure and bring different angle. So we hear more talk about the gas takeaway, take it to LNG, but we also know that West Texas is well known for renewable energy production. We also know that some of the majors that currently move to Permian, like Exxon and some others, also uh, invest into renewable uh, energy in the region. And so there was some conversation about the conflicts between the fossil energy production and renewable production from the region. But why not to have the conversation about the possible complementarity of the two? For instance, you may uh, build some natural gas power generation using the gas in place, uh, send it through uh, uh, direct currents somewhere, and then later uh, add to that renewable capacity that will now already benefit from existing infrastructure. So uh, are there any discussions about the complementarity in infrastructure, not just to produce fossil energy, but kind of all the uh, way chain up in terms of power and how else we can utilize natural gas. Um, I think I think there is so much romance in that. I mean, this is, um, um, and, and I don't think it's it's we're far away from it. Most of, of our well site, not just Shell, so you know other operators, um, are actually solar powered. So the well sites, um, before we install artificial lift on them, they're, they're solar powered. We don't need a lot of power to manage the transmitters and the, um, any of the electrical requirements. I think there's 50 watts that we need uh, in terms of, of power. But once you install gas lift or rod pumps uh, or electrical submersible pumps, you, you, need, you need higher amount of power. But, but that's on a very, very um, 
that's a, the small scale. But, but the aspiration is that in a number of years' time, we are able to frack wells. You know, it's, instead of um, what we use now, we use pumps that are powered through, through diesel, through batteries. The challenge is today, to do one frack in a horizontal well, we need 52 batteries out of a Tesla. So 52 Teslas would do one frack, right? Now, the battery technology is gonna evolve, and soon enough it will be two batteries per frack. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be five years from now or 10 years from now. But with the wind, wind uh, power that we generate in West Texas, which is significant, and with a battery recharging station, you can easily imagine that the future power that will come through a rig or a frack spread could become from a renewable source. We're also maximizing the gas lift, using the gas to, to uh, to support artificial uh, lifting of, of the well to maximize uh, recovery. All that is, is absolutely in, in, in play. May I comment right now? Because this was perfectly, and your answer was perfectly to what I wanted to say, was uh, optimizing fracking jobs, exactly this. If we reduce number of fracking jobs we have to do, we help with water, we help with uh, a bunch of uh, environmental issues. So there are technologies that you can really pinpoint and, um, and um, uh, like it fracking jobs better. They require a collection of the data. And operators right now do not acquire this data to save money. So it's like a vicious circle right. that is present. Um, so anyway, just to talk about like full life cycle, starting with reducing number of fracking jobs, optimizing how you do them, we would be in good business. We agree. Last question. Two quick questions. Jeffrey McKinnis. I was curious about the recycling of wastewater, in particular about the chemistry and technology that's involved in that particular process, and whether or not that was a barrier, a challenge that one had to address. I realize, as was mentioned, about uh, Texas regulations and, and what have you. And then uh, I think you mentioned, uh, Mayor, that uh, one could dispose of the water in many cases. However, I would think that would be difficult for many companies. Um, thank you. Let, let me just take the, uh, the, the first part. So um, the, the produced water that comes from, um, from, from the well is not, we don't change a lot of the composition or the chemistry of it. Basically what we do, it's, it's a basic uh, filtration process to make sure that you don't plug the formation when you inject it, and a certain amount of chemicals to make sure that you don't have, it's basically biocides to make sure that you don't create a lot of uh, bacteria when you start injecting and you get souring of that, that reservoir. It's pretty basic because the chemistry of the produced water doesn't change much. It's different from uh, when we use it for fracking operations, which we will need to take a significant amount of salts out of it as well as, as, um, as, as we take in and out, taking it recycling it and using it for frack. Um, and we also put it where it came from. So it goes to the same basin um, we inject in the, in the shallow part of the Delaware Basin. Uh, Joe mentioned uh, some other trials um, that, that go deeper where you know, certain operators decided to you know, go a little bit deeper than, than the base of the, the Delaware to get more injection capacity there. Um, that, that's, a different, that's, a, that's a different story. Yeah. Um, There's not a lot of barrier. I mean, it's it's fairly straightforward process. I mean, there there are some treatments, but not a lot of barriers from a tech. It's not an overly technological uh, treatment process. So, t trucking isn't a, a major issue in terms of trucking that wastewater. So we don't. So as I mentioned, we have 99% um, of our water that's produced is actually in pipe, and the remainder. The reason we only have 1% is that as we are cleaning up the well, that goes through temporary equipment. We don't have tanks anymore on our well sites, so the only way we can bring it to a pumping station is to have that um, first two days of water in a truck and put it to our salt water disposal. But when the wells start producing from the uh, well site going to the processing plant, it's all staying in pipe. Thank you. You're welcome. It is 3.30. Sure. Hi, this is Fabian with the CDUS. A side note, for the people who are uh, watching the streaming uh, live from YouTube, on that slide, I'm surprised, uh, okay, it's about the Permian. But happens that there is another US basin that right now equates another country of OPEC, Bakken. Yeah. Bakken right now is equating the same production of Venezuela. So in context, you have two US yeah. 
basins on the top uh, 10. Imagine I, that, I, you have a Permian number four and a Venus um, backend on um, Tile couldn't, couldn't agree. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think an uh, Eagleford might show up there somewhere too. But you know, this was a Permian uh, focus, so I, I just was trying to emphasize the Permian. And, and if you uh, think but, if you think West Texas got caught off guard with infrastructure, <laughs> but in go de- visit North Dakota. Right. In, in defense of North Dakota, you are absolutely correct, <laughs> and, and it's a very prolific uh, area as well. Well, so. that was I'm a gonna, side note. I'm going to pull us to an end so that we're on schedule. Would you join me in thanking our four panelists?